Welcome to Perpetual Resources webinar series with uh, Dale Kerner giving a permitting update this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to have you today. Um, as you can see, we also have the VP of uh, Public Affairs, Mackenzie Lyon, with us to answer any questions that we have. We have about 50 people that have registered for this uh, webinar today. So I'm going to just give us a few minutes to let everybody get into the room before we get started. But in the meantime, I'll go over all the housekeeping rules that we do every, every webinar series. We are here to give you as much information as we can and to answer as many questions as possible. If you do have a question during this webinar, please go down to the bottom of your screen, click on that Q&A box and put your question in there and we will do our best to get to it as soon as we can. If we aren't able to get to all of the questions that are asked today, we will um, do our best to find those answers for you and get those sent over to you via email as soon as possible. Looks like we just have a few more people that need to come on. Um, in the meantime, Dale McKenzie, would you guys like to introduce yourself? Go ahead, McKenzie. Well, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. My name is Mackenzie Lyon, and, and Shelly already introduced me a little bit, but I get to do our external affairs here at Perpetua. So my role is helping the company really live out its values and being accountable and transparent and, and working with our stakeholders. So I'm very interested in questions that you might have. And if we don't get them answered here today, please drop us a note. You know, as always, we have an open door policy, and we are very interested in the conversations we can have with you. So I think this is a good foundation for a talk today to really help um, show and, and illustrate how the project is growing and improving and, and developing. So I look forward to the conversation today. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll kick it off then. Uh, thanks for, uh, for joining today, everybody. My name is Dale Kerner. I'm the permitting manager with Perpetual Resources. Uh, here to give you an update on our, our permitting uh, process today. So. Um, let's jump into it. Um, we've been we've been working on the Stibnite Gold project for a long time now, about 11 years. I've I've been with the company for about four years, um, and even though our our name has changed yeah, to uh, to Perpetual Resources, this hasn't changed. Um, our commitment to this to this project and our commitment to uh, what we 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 feel we can do at the um, in the Stibnite Mining District to take an area that's seen a century of mining activity, and that still has a lot of legacy materials and, and um, uh, features that are still there, and use a sustainable approach to restore the environment and develop a modern mining project with criti critical mineral production. Antimony, of course, is the critical mineral that we have on site, in addition to, to gold and silver. But uh, this, is, this has been a constant um, for a long time. Uh, the plan of restoration and operations, the PRO, I think most people on the call today are probably familiar with this document that came out in September of 2016 and was our uh, initial proposed action or is our proposed action uh, for the site. You know, although this came out in 2016, there's about six years of, of pre-work and, and planning and study and engineering that, that went into that document. It has a lot, a lot behind it. And if you dive down into the appendices, you'll, you'll see some of that. But, um, you know, environmental baseline studies, of course, years and years of, of uh, environmental baseline studies for, for groundwater, surface water, soil, uh, geology, air, et cetera. A lot of work there. Uh, resource exploration and modeling, of course, uh, to develop a mine plan, we need to understand the deposit and, and plan for how we're, going to, um, how we're going to mine it. You know, the trade-off studies and alternative analysis that's listed here, there was, there's a lot there. You know, uh, to, to develop a mine plan like the PRO, you need to look at a lot of different alternatives before even the, um, you know, the NEPA process begins. You know, that, that alternatives analysis process was initiated, you know, probably around 2011, 2012, and we looked at a lot of different um, options for different things on site. So there's, there's a lot that can be unpacked there, and, and we provide a lot of that information to the forest in their analysis of the project. Preliminary engineering design, there's a lot of engineering that goes into a mine and you know, we, we continue to advance that engineering design, but we had to get it to a certain point for the pro. Um, discussions with project stakeholders was a huge part of the pro. You know, understanding people that, that, that live you know, within the immediate vicinity of Stibnite, that live you know, in Valley County, Adams County, um, in Boise, 
in Yellow Pine, in, in McCall and, and Riggins. We talked to a lot of people and, and heard their concerns. So that was a big part of putting the pro together. And our core values and principles, again, our name may have changed, but the core values and principles that are incorporated into the pro, I think they're on page one in the executive summary. Uh, those have not changed. And, and you know, even as we talk about the, the evolution of the project, we're gonna talk about that today. Uh, the core values, our core values and principles have been a, have been a, a, a guiding light for how we've, we've developed this project and continue to, to refine it. And the experience development team, We've got a lot of experience um, on this team, people that have, have been there and done that with regard to you know, mine operation and, and permitting mines and you know, uh, listening to the concerns of, of all of our project stakeholders. So great team, I, I love working with them. Um, as we've mentioned, you know, the, the uh, PRO and the, the Stibnite Gold Project is, is meant to you know, provide natural resource restoration. Um, you know, and that's going to be funded you know, by the uh, by this investment and the development of this project, but it's got some really big, really big upsides to the Stibnite Gold Project. One of the biggest ones being the restoration of salmon migration into the upper reaches of the East Fork of the South Fork, the Salmon River. There is miles and miles of habitat upstream of the Yellow Pine Pit. Uh, you know, and part of our plan is to restore that connectivity. Initially, with the with the tunnel going around the Yellow Pine Pit while we're mining. But then as a, a permanent restoration feature, you know, this backfill across the Yellow Pine Pit. And, and we'll look at that in a little more detail today. Of course, the socioeconomic uh, impact of a project like this is huge. A lot of well-paying jobs for Idahoans. And, and that's not just lip service. You know, we've been putting a lot of Idahoans to work already, you know, hiring consultants and engineers and, um, and contractors um, already out at the site. And there's, and there's more to come. And finally, you know, antimony we mentioned is a, is a mineral of critical national significance. The U.S. currently does not have a domestic source, a domestic mine source of antimony. We do recycle a bit of it, but the majority of it comes from, from other countries, the vast majority from China and some from Russia. But um, take a look at the USGS uh, uh, annual mineral survey. It's, it's a very interesting read. Antimony isn't the only mineral that we uh, have a lot of import reliance on. So we're here, here we are right now. Pro came out in 2016, four plus years of regulatory review, 75 days of public comment after the draft EIS came out. And you know, this is this is a fair bit of time and it's a lot of information to process. And we didn't just um, you know, it didn't fall upon deaf ears. We took this project and we listened to those concerns and we've uh, we've refined it accordingly. So you've probably seen this permitting timeline before. It begins in the upper left-hand corner with the submittal of our pro in September of 2016 and continues in clockwise fashion. I don't wanna dive into this in too much detail today because a lot of these steps have been completed, but let's kind of get a little bit of context and, and come into the now of where we're at right now. So the pro, of course, in September 2016 was, was submitted to the Forest Service and they proceeded through those steps of of approving the plan as being um, you know, administratively complete, putting together their scoping, both internal and public, for uh, getting comments on that proposed action, putting their interdisciplinary teams together, selecting a third party contractor, getting things kicked off. Now you'll see the next box there after EIS project initiation is alternatives and environmental analysis. This was a process that took a couple of years and, and both um, Midas at the time and the agencies came to the table with a potential um, alternative components for the, for the proposed action that, that we needed to evaluate to determine if there were going to be better options for the project in, in some or, in, or, in, or just in part. So there's a lot of evaluation that took part during that alternatives and environmental analysis phase. And some things came out of that, that that showed us that there were potentials for, for improvement and refinement of this project uh, before it went to the to draft, uh, as in to the draft EIS. So in the next box, so you'll see the Mod Pro in May 2016, or that should be 2019 actually, sorry for the typo. The Mod Pro uh, was released in May of 2019 and preceded the draft EIS. And this was a better version of the Pro. Uh, we, you know, we added a couple of things. We took a couple of things away. Um, 
we reduced environmental impacts, um, and, and we released this before the draft EIS. So when the draft EIS came out, the pro was alternative one, the mod pro was alternative two. And then there was alternatives three and, and four and five. Uh, alternative three was uh, focused on moving the location of the tailing storage facility. Alternative four focused around uh, using existing infrastructure for primary site access. Then alternative five was the no action alternative. But um, just wanna you know, focus on the fact that that mod pro was alternative two. We felt, we know it was a better project and um, you know, as we went into the DIS thinking that the mod pro was gonna be the clear front runner. So the uh, comment period for the draft DIS, normally 45 days got extended by a month to 75 days. And that kind of brings us up to date now with this uh, we are here bubble where um, you know, the forest service and their uh, third party EIS contractor, Stantec are responding to comments on the draft EIS and they're preparing the final EIS and draft record of decision. There's a lot going on there because there were, there were a lot of comments, almost 10,000 or maybe even over 10,000 comments on the draft EIS. So there's a, there's a lot of activity going on to, to address all those comments. They're all very important. And we've been reviewing those comments as well because we also want to know, you know what, what the public and, and what the agencies think of our plan. So you'll see another box in that respond to comments. And this is about uh, the refinement of alternative two. And we're gonna talk about that today. You know, we reviewed all the comments on the draft EIS. We listened to what our project stakeholders were saying. We looked at the effects analysis in the draft EIS. And we realized that there was a way to refine that alternative two to make it a, yet even a better project. Uh, before we jump into that, I just want to give you a little bit of a sense of how many how many things are moving forward in parallel here. Um, there's there's a lot again. There's a lot happening, but I'd like to give you a little bit of a sense of what's informing you know this evolution of our proposed action. So on the top there, project development. That's that's uh, that's perpetual resources. That's us working to put our best foot forward with regard to our plan. On the second line or the second row there. The NEPA process is led by the Forest Service and they're assisted with by their third party EIS contractor, Stantec. So those are those blue boxes. Um, the next line down is permitting. You know, I, I've, I've added this to this, uh, to this graphic to illustrate that, you know, our permitting process started over 10 years ago with, with um, initial data collection and, and then uh, working that into the, the modeling um, for you know, for putting our permits together and starting our preliminary engineering design. So long process for permitting. And I just wanted to illustrate that on this graphic. And then finally, engineering, or not finally, but the next row down, engineering and economics. I mentioned the trade-off studies that fed into the PRO um, that came out in 2016 and the preliminary engineering design, which all led up to our preliminary feasibility study, which kind of opened up the door for the development of the PRO and the release of the PRO in 2016. But we continue to advance that engineering and economics. We had to. You know, a big part of the alternatives analysis for NEPA was, um, you know, evaluating the the uh, um, engineering technical feasibility of um, of the alternatives to determine if they could be folded into the project. And then finally, the the last row down there is modeling. And the reason I've added this here is because you know our modeling, our predictive modeling for you know surface water and groundwater quality for the temperature of the, of the streams and the um, other you know, water features at site, for air quality, you know, for site-wide water chemistry. All these models you know, of, you know, contributed to, um, or have been continually contributing to these reports we've been putting together to allow the, the Forest Service to appropriately evaluate the uh, environmental effects of the project. These things continue to refine and as we've been, uh, you know, as the project has been evolving, we haven't been ignoring those refined models. We want to fold them in to ensure that we have best available data for, for this project, you know, right, even as we get up to the, you know, into the draft EIS and, and moving into the final EIS. We want to make sure we've got best available data. So a lot of things moving in parallel here, but what I want to focus on for the rest of our discussion today is this top row. Again, as we've been moving this project forward, we started out with the PRO in September of 2016. 
All these parallel processes contributed to the refinement of the Pro, um, the Mod Pro in May of 2019, and that made it into the draft EIS as alternative two. We're gonna talk today about our refinement of the Mod Pro that we submitted in December of 2020. What does it mean? How did the project improve? What changed? Let's talk about it. To understand the refined Mod Pro, we gotta talk about the Mod Pro first. Again, this is alternative two of the draft EIS. These are some of the benefits that were made, some of the changes that were made to the um, Pro to develop the Mod Pro, again, DIS alternative two. Um, this was informed by the alternatives analysis process. You know, I mentioned that you know, a reasonable range of alternatives needed to be evaluated. That's part of NEPA. So that's a process that we participated in with the Forest Service and the third party contractor. So some things, some positives came out of that. Uh, public and agency comments on the pro, absolutely. One of the biggest features of the Mod Pro, this, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but uh, this through site public access road. That was a big ticket item in the Mod Pro, and that came out of the, the public comment process. Um, and we, you know, we, we considered that and we did a lot of, did a lot of um, uh, preliminary engineering design to come up with, the, with that feasible through site public access road. You know, preliminary impact analysis and modeling. You know, we, uh, of course, the Forest Service does the effects analysis for the draft EIS, but we inform, you know, our own decisions about site features by doing preliminary impact analysis. Is this feature gonna make uh, surface water uh, quality better or worse? You know, is putting this material here gonna benefit or, or not benefit groundwater? And we need to know those things and then they get refined and analyzed by the forest in the actual effects analysis, but we, we do preliminary impact analysis to inform our process. Preliminary engineering and feasibility, that, that's just a given. You know, can we put a uh, through site public access road um, um, coming through our, our mine project? Well, we know now that we can, but you need to do that preliminary engineering and feasibility to, to make sure that that's possible. And, and of course, stakeholder interaction. You know, we don't wanna go behind a curtain, um, you know, after our proposed action comes out. We wanna hear from people, both in the, you know, the formal processes of project scoping, but also through our own, um, you know, stakeholder interaction. The purpose of the Mod Pro, relative to the pro was to reduce the footprint of the project and reduce environmental impacts. You know, one of the, the big facets of the, of the Mod Pro was the elimination of the West End DRSF that's up here just east of the West End pit. You know, by, by changing some things around by partially backfilling the hangar flats pit, we were able to eradicate a feature and save or reduce the project disturbance footprint by about 68 acres. Or somewhere thereabouts, might have been 70 and change. But um, you know, that was that was a big thing to get rid of that development rock storage facility um, in that drainage. Uh, to address the concerns of, of the public and agencies, you know, the, the scoping process on our proposed action um, you know, generated a lot of comments and we we reviewed all those to see how we could tweak this project and make it make it better. And again, to, just to wrap up here, that last bullet, the modified proposed action, the Mod Pro, was incorporated into the draft EIS as alternative two. Again, Pro alternative one, Mod Pro alternative two. Here's a, here's a summary of the, the alternatives that were included in the draft EIS, which I've mentioned already. Pro's alternative one, Mod Pro was alternative two. I'll talk about that asterisk in a moment here. Alternative three, I already mentioned, was the moving the East Fork of the South Fork of the tailing storage facility. I'm sorry, moving the tailing storage facility into the upper East Fork of the South Fork of the Salmon River. Um, this was an agency alternative, uh, not our preference, certainly, but it was something that, as it is a reasonable alternative, it needs to be evaluated in the draft EIS. So we provided information on, on what that, you know, the engineering feasibility of that of that alternative. Alternative four is the Yellow Pine route. Um, if you go to Yellow Pine for the Harmonica Festival this August, you will very likely travel up Warm Lake Road and then up Johnson Creek Road and take a, um, a, take a right on the East Fork, uh, South Fork Road. Um, you know, we, we plan to use that road or that route temporarily uh, to get to the site, but we also wanna make our own 
route of access, the burnt log route, uh, so we can minimize our interaction with, with public traffic and uh, reduce environmental impacts you know, along Johnson Creek and the East Fork of the South Fork. So again, not our preference, but one that is within the re uh, reasonable range of alternatives and needs to be evaluated and is evaluated in the draft. And finally, alternative five, the no action alternative, that the project not, does not move forward uh, that none of the restoration benefits that we've included in our project would be realized, nor, nor would any of the, of the other activities, including mining. So the draft EIS came out and, and um, you know, these are some of the highlights of that document uh, that came out of that document. You know, so we've, we've kind of brought these to the, to the surface, of course, because we think that they characterize, you know, the benefits that we've been that we've been touting for a very long time. And I don't wanna read all these, but I'll, I'll, I'll just read a, read a couple out of the first column here, you know, that the historical barrier to fish migration is a, is a big one. You know, the current yellow pine pit uh, has a cascade into it that's got a very steep gradient fish, you know, anadromous fish can't get up it. Um, and part of the, you know, one of the biggest uh, improvements uh, to the site included in the pro is to backfill that yellow pine pit and reestablish the uh, east fork of the south fork of the salmon river across that backfill an appropriate gradient for an adernus fish to be able to get back upstream and access up upper east fork of the south fork now, so the draft eis recognizes that long-term access to historically blocked critical habitat would it result in increased productivity you know, that's, that's a, a song we've been singing for a long time and it was, it was, you know, recognized through the effects analysis in the draft EIS. You know, and, and also looking at the second, you know, passage there, that free movement and access to habitat can improve genetic diversity of isolated populations. That's getting a little bit into the weeds, but, you know, if you know fisheries and if you know some about evolutionary biology, you know that that's an important thing. Genetic diversity is important um, uh, to a, uh, you know, to populations of, of any, any species. So anyway, I, I, I don't want to read through all these because I know we got a, a bit of limited time today, but, you know, again, these were some of the things that we brought to the surface out of the draft EIS um, to, to kind of highlight uh, that because they reinforce some, um, some things that we've been seeing for a long time. And there is a final note on this slide that, I, that I'd like to call out. You know, those reading the draft EIS should take note of Appendix D which is, you know, not everybody always looks at the appendices, but it reviews the voluntary and required mitigation to offset the impacts of mining. So, you know, in, in reading through the draft EIS, you know, one of the, one of the things that, you know, being kind of um, relegated to Appendix D, some of the mitigation that we were proposing and that we put forth in both the pro and the mod pro, you know, is included in that appendix. So I would encourage you to, to when you read that document, give it a thorough read and note that Appendix D has some very important information in it. Um, you know, the, the NEPA process is, is really designed to uh, incorporate those, you know, the evolution of those parallel tracks I showed you in that previous slide. And when you put a proposed action out there, you know, NEPA ensures First of all, that it gets you know appropriate environmental review, but it also accounts for you know as these things pass through time, you know new ways of doing things can come to the surface through this alternatives analysis process. So we, we want to make sure that we again use best available data, incorporate good ideas, and evaluate many ideas to find those good ideas, and and put put our best foot forward. And, and consider and realize that this project is going to change. Well, how does it change? Well, part of it is, is public comment. And one of, the, one of the beautiful things about NEPA is that it incorporates the public into the process. So people took this to heart when, when the draft EIS came out and a lot of people participated in the public comment process, which is a great thing to see uh, people get engaged in a process like this. So thousands and thousands of comments uh, came out on the draft EIS you know, we were, we were tracking this on a daily basis and we, you know, we noted that um, and we, we were very pleasantly, um, not surprised, but we, we, it was pleasant to see that many of these comments were positive. You know, our, our message, all these well, webinars like these that we've done over the years to get information out there 
we've gotten that information out there. And there were a lot of positive comments over about 85% of the, of the total number of comments on the draft were positive. That's very encouraging. Um, it make, makes me feel good about what I do. So, you know, and, and those, those do make us feel good, but we also want to look at those negative comments. You see them in the, in the histogram there. You know, what can we learn from those negative comments? What are people, you know, still concerned about? How can we refine and improve our project to address those negative comments? That's where we wanted to focus. And that's where we did focus for continued uh, refinement of, of the Mod Pro. So some bullets on the right here to, to kind of, you know, detail that process. Of course, we, you know, the, uh, both the Forest Service and cooperating agencies and us, you know, review all the comments. Uh, the Forest Service and, and their third party contractor are responsible for responding to each and every one of those comments. Um, and that will be included in the, in the final EIS. Um, you know, and then uh, as, as, that, as that process proceeds, you know, we're, we're of course providing additional information to the forest as needed. Um, if, if they need additional information to, to respond to these comments. And eventually that process is gonna result in the publishing of the final environmental impact statement with a draft record of decision where the forest will determine what, what they feel is the best uh, alternative included in that uh, range of alternatives. Uh, once that draft record of decision or rod comes out, there may be people that object to that decision and there will be a period of, of uh, objection resolution uh, to that draft record of decision then it, that will ultimately result in a final record of decision. We're very much looking forward to that day and uh, when, when we can get our project uh, off the ground. Shelly, any, uh, maybe I'll take a pause there and see if anything's popped up to the, to the moment. Sure, we can take a quick pause. And um, we do have one that, that is uh, good to address here. Um, gentleman had the question and either you or McKenzie can take this. Um, how do you think, or do you think that the change in administration uh, will affect our permitting timeline and our approval or record of decision? McKenzie, do you want to take that one? Absolutely, and I, and I think that's a good question and certainly one that we're getting quite often lately. You know, I think it's really important to kind of step back and from our standpoint, we wrote the project, we designed the project really to be agnostic from a political standpoint. When we're mining for a critical mineral that's key to the low carbon energy future, when we're restoring an abandoned mining site and we are designing a project to go above and beyond what those required standards are from an environmental standpoint, it really gets us to a point where the project shouldn't be politicized. And um, for those reasons, I think um, we can find a lot of support and we have found support from both sides of the, the political spectrum. I would also add that, you know, through the permitting process, most of the, the individuals involved, you know, with Dale and his team from a day-to-day -day in and out permitting process standpoint are the career staff who remain. And so we really see a lot of continuity moving forward um, in the folks that we work with from a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, we've also taken a lot of hope and some, some positive signals from the Biden administration's executive order two weeks ago around critical supply chains and specifically critical minerals um, like antimony that we have here within the Stibnite Gold Project and critical supply chains around battery storage and around semiconductors, all of which antimony plays a role in. So we are seeing signals that, you know, a project like this that stands out for, you know, both being on a brownfield site, but then also producing a critical mineral can have a path forward in this administration and any administration. Thanks, Mackenzie. Um, I'm, I'm a judging that you're uh, letting you guys kind of gauge the, the question content and stuff, and we can either, you know, add, do, take another one now or, or do it at the end. I would, I would say let's go ahead and keep going, and then we can um, sit around running on Q&A as soon as you've 
the presentation. Okay, very good, thank you. All right, so let's get back into it. So draft EIS, thousands and thousands of comments, our own um, evolving modeling and, and internal analysis, all these things moving forward in parallel. And when the, when the draft EIS uh, comment period was completed, we took a pause, we kind of compiled all of our, our thoughts and our notes. And these, this is what we came up with, these identified areas for improvement. And we still had we still had opportunities to you know to to refine and improve the project and and these are a couple of the key areas. One was reducing seasonal stream flow reductions. You know, with the um, uh, the uh, Hangar Flats Pit Lake, you know, the period of filling for that would have would have pulled um, you know water off of Meadow Creek uh, and and impacted groundwater. So you know the the Hangar Flats Pit Lake was something that. That, that was, you know, we wanted to focus there. What can we do there? We don't want to reduce, you know, seasonal stream flow. Um, you, know, uh, you know, also some of the dewatering was impacting that. So we, we, had, uh, we, we had some work to do there. Improving water quality and quantity, absolutely. I mean, the, you know, probably the most important next to the, the fisheries, you know, this is our major focus at the site is, is improving surface water and groundwater quality and re related to stream flow uh, quantity. So we wanted to find ways where we could, you know, we, we'd incorporated the water quality management plan into alternative two of the draft EIS. And that is not exclusive to draft two. That's a concept that can be applied to any alternative of the, um, that was evaluated in the draft. But this is very definitely a focus of, of what we want to do at the site. Get rid of these legacy materials, you know, put them in, in uh, modern uh, des engineering design facilities where they're not going to be, you know, leaking contaminants into the into the groundwater aquifer, um, you know, isolating these materials at the surface so they're not impacting surface water. Very much a focus, and we'll talk about um, some of the improvements we've made. Reducing stream temperatures very important to fish, you know, that we not increase uh, stream temperatures. And um, when we finally got to see the uh, chapter four of the draft EIS. That was, that was one of the things that, that popped out was that, you know, some of the stream temperature impacts, um, even in our, in our Mod Pro, had not been reduced to the degree that we'd wanted. And again, this comes out of predictive modeling. Um, you know, so we wanted to see what else can we do to, uh, to reduce stream temperatures? And we'll talk about what, what we, uh, an improvement that we made to, to reduce, you know, summer maximum stream temperatures. And then finally, you know, kind of the, the big one is to reduce the footprint. You know, with the Mod Pro, we eliminated the um, the West End DRSF, big footprint reduction. With the you know continued improvement and refinement of the Mod Pro, we've made another big change uh, to reduce project footprint by over 160 acres with the elimination of fiddle. And I'll show you a, a figure of that here in a moment. So these were, in general, the areas we were looking at to uh, to improve the project, and these these manifested in a couple of different ways. Here they are. Here's a, here's a figure of the site with some um, some of these improvements tagged with those little blue um, post-its. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about these in more detail, but very generally here. I already mentioned that the Fiddle DRSF was eliminated. And uh, hopefully you can see my cursor here. The Fiddle DRSF was right here. Um, you know, a, a feature in the middle of the, of the Fiddle drainage. And uh, we've eliminated that 168 acre reduction in overall project footprint. Well, all that rock development rock has to go somewhere. We'll talk about where it goes here in a moment. Um, we've added Stibnite Lake on the Yellow Pine Pit backfill. That's right up here. You'll note that the Yellow Pine Pit currently has a lake in it, which is um, you know, a function of the fact that there was an, uh, a mine pit there. And it's and the East Fork of the South Fork has been allowed to flow into it. But you know, when we remove that lake to expand the Yellow Pine Pit and then eventually uh, backfill the Yellow Pine Pit and reestablish East Fork of the South Fork drainage across the backfill. Uh, you know we lose, and you know when we lose that lake, we lose some habitat, some bull trout habitat. So the Stibnite Lake is added to to, uh, to fix a couple of things. One, it widens and deepens the East Fork of the South Fork channel in a, in a in a certain area, and that helps reduce summer maximum stream temperatures. And again, this comes this is demonstrated. Uh, through modeling. But it also uh, replaces that bull trout fisheries habitat that's lost when we, um, you know, when we uh, first expand and then backfill the alpine pit. So, so it serves a couple of different purposes. 
Uh, an enhanced riparian planning prescription. Uh, you'll see here, uh, this, this tab here is pointing to the East Fork and the South Fork. You know, to, one of the ways to, um, to decrease surface water temperatures is to shade the channel. So we'd already included some riparian planting, you know, in our reclamation and restoration for the project, by, but by tweaking the prescription, you know, taller plants, uh, a wider area, um, you know, we were able to, to, uh, to reduce some of those surface water temperatures and provide additional benefits. And here's another big ticket item, a smaller hangar flats pit. One of the biggest changes in the, in the refinement of the Mod Pro is the reduction of the hangar flats pit significantly. The, the pit is reduced in volume by 70% and is completely backfilled. So on previous, you know, certainly in the Pro, but even in the Mod Pro, uh, there was a pit lake that remained in the hangar flats pit area or footprint. In, in the refined version of the Mod Pro, uh, that pit is completely backfilled. So some of that rock, development rock from Fiddle would go into the um, hangar flats pit to, to completely backfill it. Uh, another feature of the refined Mod Pro is that we have no rapid infiltration basins or ribs. Now, we were gonna be doing a, a fair bit of uh, dewatering uh, during the um, hangar flats pit mining, you know, to make sure that water, groundwater is not coming into our pit. And some of that excess dewatering water was going into rapid infiltration basins. Well, as we refine these models, these groundwater models, we've realized that we, we won't have as much water coming out of those dewatering uh, wells as we thought. And some of the other site-wide water balance you know, um, you know, things have factored into this, but we've been able to get rid of these rapid infiltration basins. They were a bit of a, a complication with regard to, you know, figuring out how are we going to permit, you know, that that much water going into the back into the groundwater aquifer. But, you know, it's it's uh, they've been eliminated from the project. Uh, the enhanced TSF buttress. This refers to, you know, again, some of that development rock from fiddles got to go somewhere. So, you know, we originally had the, uh, the TSF buttress. You know, to um, uh, you know, uh, lapped up against the uh, the TSF uh, dam, and by increasing the volume of that material, you know, we're going to make that that feature an even safer feature. You know, the 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 dam, of course, is designed to be um, have its own factor of safety that meets requirements. By putting that buttress against it, and now adding material to that buttress, we make this a very very stable feature. Uh, the TSF liner in compliance with the uh, DEQ's signidation rule. You know, we added this because the signidation rule has, has undergone an update. You know, the, the signidation rules from 2005 that had never been um, applied. So as we started to, to get into it, you know, we noticed that it was kind of a one size fits all. You know, we, we worked with DEQ uh, to, you know, to make some accommodations in the, the signidation rule to be more site specific. We didn't want to reduce anything. We wanted to make this more site specific, more applicable uh, to a site like ours. So TSF liner will be in compliance with, with DEQ signidation rule. And finally, the, the water quality management plan. You know, initially the water quality management plan <clears throat> in the draft EIS was, was, was tied to alternative two, but it was not exclusive to alternative two. And, and what I'm saying there is that you know, the water treatment and the water management that was detailed in alternative two could have been applied to any alternative in the draft. And if the Forest Service so chooses, that could be the case with what ends up being the selected alternative. So we'll dive down into a couple of these a little bit more. Um, the, the, this is the, uh, a, a figure that focuses on the northern half of the site. So Fiddle DRSF eliminated um, and, and that's this feature right here. We zoomed in on, and if you'll recall from other figures, that was a that was a sizable a sizable feature in the fiddle drainage. And we've eliminated the DRSF. We do have a, a much smaller growth media stockpile in that drainage, and that of course will be temporary until reclamation. But we reduced our overall footprint by 168 acres. That is that is a significant reduction, and you know there's all the accordant benefits of not impacting. Um, you know, the waters of the U.S. and, and wetlands and, and uh, wildlife habitat and vegetation impacts. So there's a lot of, of, of accordant impacts that, or reduction in impacts that come along 
uh, with that. And then, you know, a big benefit that came out of getting rid of fiddle was the reduced service water quality impacts. We were going to cap the fiddle DRSF to reduce infiltration, but even so, uh, you know, water getting into that material and, and coming out at the toe of that, of that feature was going to require, a, you know, a long-term um, surface water management treatment. So getting rid of that, that feature um, at the surface reduced those, those requirements. Um, I already mentioned the, the Stibnite Lake on the Yellow Pine Pit backfill. Again, this is, you know, call it a lake if you like, but it's a, a widened and deepened portion of the restored East Fork, South Fork Salmon River Channel. And the geometry of that feature reduces maximum summer, summer surface water temperatures effectively, something that, that came out of the effects analysis. And I already mentioned it replaces bull trout habitat lost through the eradication of the Alpine Pit Lake. So a big benefit there. Um, I already spoke to the enhanced riparian uh, planting prescription, taller, taller plants, wider planting corridor, more shade, cooler service water temperatures. You know, and then some of the things that we wanted to maintain in this refinement of the Mod Pro, because they were, they were good things that, that, that came out of the uh, development of the Mod Pro was, you know, the through site access, you know, public access coming through the site during operations on a seasonal basis, something we wanted to maintain. It was very important to people in the comment process. We wanted to make, make sure we maintained that um, through site public access. And then the on-site line production. You know, this came out of the alternatives analysis process for the draft EIS. It reduced our traffic by over 20%. Lime is a, is a huge uh, con consumable uh, in the ore processing circuit. And by using material out of the West End pit and processing it in a lime kiln. You know, there's some trade-off with the emissions from the lime kiln, quantified all those, but reducing traffic by almost a quarter was, was a big benefit of, of on-site lime production. We maintain that in the refined mod grill. Um, here we're jumping down to the southern end of the site, just to highlight some of the benefits that I've already kind of introduced a little bit. But you know, the hangar flats pit reduced by 70%. The overall volume of mine material in this refined Mod Pro is a 10% reduction, a 44 million ton reduction in mined material. So try to wrap your head around that. <laughs> but a lot of that comes from the reduction of the Hanger Flats pit uh, by, by 70% of its, of its volume. No pit lake, completely backfilled. Um, you know, that backfill not only prevents us from having a pit lake there and having the, the surface water management and treatment associated with it, but it also helps uh, stabilize that high wall above the uh, hangar flats pit. You know, you can't see it really here on a 2D map, but, you know, the hangar flats pit is at the base of the slope. And, you know, um, we want to stabilize that slope to the degree we can and backfilling that pit instead of having it as a, a remain long term as a pit lake benefits that. Um, I already mentioned the enhanced TSF buttress right here. Uh, again, some of the material from Fiddle uh, getting redistributed to the tailing storage facility buttress, add stability to that um, tailing storage facility dam. Um, I already mentioned the incorporation of, of the water quality management plan, not exclusive to alternative two by any means, but something that, you know, to really build out a fully developed refined mod pro, something that we folded into this plan, you know, to demonstrate uh, how this would work for, you know, managing water and treating water, you know, from the various places where we have to, to treat con uh, contact and process water. Uh, I already mentioned the tailing storage facility liner, uh, compliant with the DEQ cyanide rule, of course. And then also maintaining these additional restoration goals. We did not want to change in the refined mod pro things that were, were, were big benefits. You know, we wanted to maintain all these restoration goals. You know, the soda, you'll recall it, the, the spent ore disposal area, which is located in here, incorporating that into the starter dam and reprocessing these legacy tailings underneath, you know, a big, big uh, ticket item with regard to, to site restoration. These unconstrained, you know, 1930s era tailings that are sitting in the Meadow Creek drainage, um, you know, reprocessing those 
and then um, putting that remaining material in the tailing storage facility, <clears throat> huge, huge benefits to both groundwater and surface water. Um, and then Blowout Creek, you know, the last one on here, you know, Blowout Creek is, is not really within our, our um, footprint uh, for the mine, but it doesn't make sense to do all, have all these restoration goals in the Upper East Fork, South Fork Salmon River drainage and not address Blowout Creek. It's generating a huge amount of sentiment still, even after what, what 50, 60 years of uh, after this, um, this dam blew out. It's, it's something that needs to be dealt with and we keep it in our refined project. So if I were gonna give my elevator speech to somebody, what, what does the refined Mod Pro do? Why should this be the considered the latest and greatest proposed action um, from perpetual resources and the best option for moving forward with the Stibnet Gold Project? Well, here's some of the highlights that I've already spoken to. 10% reduction in total volume mined, 44 million tons. A lot of that comes from 70% reduction in the size of the hangar flats pit. Again, we reduce that pit, we reduce its depth, we completely backfill it. A lot of accordant benefits that come with that, reduce water management um, and, and not impacting seasonal um, uh, service water flows. You know, uh, there's some other tweaks to the other pits, uh, but uh, overall we have a 7% reduction in service disturbance by changing the geometry of our open pits. That's 37 acres. You couple that with 168 acre reduction in disturbance by eliminating the fiddle DRSF. We're talking about big changes with this refined mod pro um, that, that make it a, a, a better project with a smaller footprint um, and, and, and certainly less, uh, less surface disturbance. A couple other benefits listed on the right here. You know, we, we made some, some very minor tweaks to the ore processing circuit. And um, what it does is it reduces the solubility of arsenic in the mine tailings. Now those are in a mine, in a, a lined facility, of course, but um, you know, anytime you can reduce the solubility of arsenic in your, in your, in your byproducts, it's a, it's a good thing. I mentioned the less required dewatering in particularly the hangar flats pit and the elimination of, of the rapid infiltration basin. And we've spoken to the measures to reduce stream temperatures. Minor things, you know, changing our planning prescription, um, you know, widening and, and um, deepening a portion of the East Fork of the South Fork of the Salmon River. Now, these are not wholesale changes in the plan, but they add up to big benefits. And I already mentioned the addition of the Yellow Pine Pit Lake. So do we meet our objectives? You know, we went into uh, refining the Mod Pro with some very significant objectives. Again, number one, we wanted to have quantifiable benefits. We wanted to be able to show, you know, if this refined project is incorporated into the final AIS, we want it to be a clear front runner. Quantifiable benefits, reduced surface water temperatures, improved, um, you know, groundwater and surface water quality, you know, reduced impacts to, you know, all, you know, things related to surface disturbance, you know, wildlife habitat, vegetation, et cetera. Uh -huh. Wanted to make sure that the, the numbers matched the, the, the talk. Um, this this uh, refined mod pro absolutely incorporates best available data, refined modeling data um, and analysis that have been proceeding in those parallel tracks that I showed you. We wanted to address agency and public comments in the draft EIS. There were a lot of them, a lot of them positive, we wanted to make sure we address those negative comments, maintaining the, the features that, that, that warranted the positive comments, but address those negative comments and did what we could to alleviate those concerns about those remaining impacts. Reduce the footprint, of course. Some, some uh, remove the elimination of the, of the fiddle DRSF, big reduction in footprint. And, and with, all these, with all these minor you know, changes, we're, we're Reducing environmental impacts. That's the, the the name of the. It's right in the title. Environmental impact analysis. You know, we want to we want to reduce those environmental impacts as much as we can. Now, to as we're doing all this, as we're making these these very minor changes and improvements, we have to make sure that this is consistent with NEPA and all the other regulatory frameworks that we're working you know under. All these all these permitting processes and regulatory frameworks 
you know, we, we can't, we, we can't do something over here to benefit the project if we're going to, you know, violate some, some regulation over here. So I, we always have to keep that in view. And then of course, maintain perpetuous core values and restoration goals. That's been, that's been a theme from 2010 on. So my, my elevator speech went a little bit beyond 30 seconds, but um, here, here's some other key takeaways. The refined mod pro is not a new plan. I've showed you today that we've, we've re we reduced the footprint. We've made minor changes in the geometry of some features but this is not a new plan in that we've not proposed um, you know, large new features. We've not proposed large new processes. Um, this is a, a refinement and improvement of a plan that's out there. The proposed improvements are responsive to comments received during the comment period. Again, those 1,367 negative comments, we looked at every single one of them, grouped them and addressed them. We wanted to make sure that, that people that, that took the time to submit a public comment on the draft EIS, uh, we wanted to make sure that, that those comments were, were considered and where possible uh, incorporated into our improvement. And, and uh, you know, our, again, the, the, whole, the, the, the theme running through all of this was to improve the project's environmental outcomes and reduce the footprint. When we looked at chapter four of the draft EIS, the Mod Pro we felt was, you know, clearly the preferred alternative but there were ways that we could make it more clearly a preferred alternative. We wanted to make those, you know, deltas in, you know, surface disturbance, wetland disturbance, surface water quality, groundwater quality. We wanted to make a clear front runner uh, for what we feel should be selected as a preferred alternative. So how do we move forward now? Well, the suggestions that we've put forward, this refined Mod Pro or Mod Pro 2, uh, has been submitted to the Forest Service. We need to submit a lot of additional information and data to demonstrate um, and allow them to conduct their effects analysis to, to prove out, okay, we, we think it's a better project, but the numbers gotta, you know, once we run it through the mill, the numbers gotta show that it actually is a better project and, and has reduced environmental impacts. So, and of course, this is part of NEPA. And one of the, one of the, one of the better parts of NEPA, the, the incorporation of, of public comment, and then the potential for a project to be improved uh, from, from the start of the process to the, uh, to, the, to the end of it. So here's the, um, oh, that should, let me, let me, there we go, okay. So in the final EIS, this is what we think, um, or what we propose ought to happen. That alternative two, which was initially the Mod Pro, should be replaced with this improved alternative two or this improved Mod Pro. We've reduced the disturbance. We've improved water temperatures, cooler water. We've improved water quality by getting rid of, of large surface features and, and uh, reducing our um, the amount of material that could potentially impact water quality. And in doing so, we've also reduced long-term water management from features like getting rid of the fiddle DRSF. You know, 10% reduction in mining, you know, uh, that's, you know, part of that is, uh, comes from a reduction in emissions, but there's also all the things associated with all that activity. And when you reduce our, our overall volume by 44 million tons, there's gonna be um, environmental benefits there. And then, and then absolutely maintaining the restoration benefits that we incorporated from, from the get-go into the Mod Pro. I didn't mean to make that rhyme, but it did. So this is what we would love to see the final EIS look like because we feel that the refined Mod Pro would be a clear front runner for selection. So I, I'm gonna check my time here. I do wanna leave a couple of, um, of uh, can we go over time, Shelly and McKinsey? I, I know some people might not want to uh, go past the hour, but I do want to make sure we give time for questions. Yeah, I think you just have a few more slides left, Dale. So I would say uh, roll through those and then we can start the questions. It yeah, will do. All right, so we'll revisit this slide, our permitting timeline. Again, we are here. The, the forest and the third party contractor are responding to comments. Um, as they're doing so, 
we've we've put forward this this refined mod pro refined alternative two and and we we've said you know take it or leave it but this is this is a better version of of the of alternative two here's the data to back that up here's all the information you need to conduct um this analysis you know we would we would love to see this um, as a refined version of alternative two in the final EIS. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. And then moving through these, these remaining stages, you know, the final EIS will be published with a draft record of decision. And you know, hopefully, potentially by the end of the year, uh, a final record of decision on the Stibnet Gold Project will be out there, but lots to do before that happens. So, um, you know, we've, we've had recent accomplishments, you know, we, the draft EIS was a long time coming. We we're glad to see that come out in August. Uh, we thought the comment period was successful just because it had so much participation. Uh, we also released our feasibility study after our, our refined um, alternative two. This is a detailed economic analysis of our, of our project, but part of, of what we have to do to advance our project. Um, you know, we signed a historic agreement with federal agencies. The ASAOC is a big thing in that it's, you know, it's not necessarily tied to our, our proposed action on the site, but it allows us to conduct some activities prior to mining that will provide huge benefits at the site and, and assist in the cleanup of, uh, of surface water and groundwater and, and other media at the site. So that was a big win. And then, of course, our name change, Perpetual Resources. In, in February of 21, you know, from Midas Gold to Perpetual Resources, I love the name change. I think it's a great, um, great symbology for the, for the company, and um, I'm, I'm all in. I love it. I already have a new hat. Uh, upcoming milestones, the FEIS and draft rod in, in 2021, you know, probably, probably quarter, third quarter of the year. It'd be great if we saw the final rod in 2021. Of course, these, uh, these schedules are always somewhat plastic, but you know, when, when the final rod comes out, that is not the end of the road for us. We've got many, many um, ancillary permits. That's, you know, it's part of my, my title, permitting manager. Um, and that list is, is pretty long. We've, we've already got those in, in process. We wanna make sure we have them in time uh, to potentially start construction in you know, possibly 2022 or perhaps 2023. But we also need to establish our project financial assurance. You know, we've we've given other webinars about you know the uh, standard uh, reclamation cost estimator. You know, we're taking a new approach to uh, financial assurance that uh, to alleviate these concerns about you know companies walk away and leaving big messes. Our financial assurance is going to be robust, and it is going to you know allow for or or, or I guess provide a, a degree of comfort for. Um, if something ever were to happen where those funds would be needed to clean up the site, they will be there and they will be sufficient. Um, you know, construction and early restoration, we've got that those three years of construction with, with early restoration activities. We'd love to start in 2022, but um, maybe 2023, but we've got, you know, three years where we got to build that mine, we got to finish that access road, a lot of, a lot of things to do. <clears throat> You know, and based on that schedule, we may be operating, the, the mine may be operating by as early as 2026. Ah, there we are. So um, hopefully folks, I, I know I've got a minute or two over, but hopefully we can stick around and address any questions that have surfaced. Thank you, Dale, I really appreciate it. Um, the first question is actually gonna be for Mackenzie. Um, Mackenzie, could you give an update on the ASAOC and maybe start with what that means and sure. then a status of the NESPERS lawsuit? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with the lawsuit first. Um, so a few weeks ago, both parties, the parties being the NESPERS tribe and Perpetua Resources, agreed to a stay of the lawsuit, which essentially means that the legal proceedings will be suspended so that both parties can go into dispute resolution or dispute resolution process. Now, our goal and our hope has always been that our common goals of seeing water quality at Stibnite improved and seeing benefits brought directly to the fisheries of the region, that those common goals could establish a framework 
for us to have a sustainable resolution um, moving forward with the tribe. And so we are hopeful for that, but that process is now underway. I would then also say, so the ASAOC is uh, an agreement between Perpetua Resources and the EPA and Department of Justice. Now, this agreement was three years in the making, where we initially went to these agencies because Stibnite, as an abandoned mine district, has three circle of decrees covering it. So essentially, it's covered under some of our Superfund law. In order for us to have any type of action on site that would immediately help address some of the water quality concerns that we and others have at Stibnite, or to look at opportunities to potentially clean up more of site beyond just what we've already suggested in our in our pro in the project footprint that we were going to need permission from our regulators and we were also going to need a clearer path around questions of liability on a surplus site you know many of you may be familiar with a concept that has been floating around for you know over a decade on good samaritan action and, and good samaritan action is when a volunteer entity wants to come forward and be part of a solution around one of these abandoned mine sites the thing that stops it from happening most often however is the question of not wanting to inherit the liability of past actors uh, so we entered into this agreement with epa as i mentioned after three years of study and development with agencies and um, consultation with a number of stakeholders. Now the agreement is phased, which is really important. Uh, the first phase this act, uh, this, of the next four years is really focused on the immediate action that needs to take place at site. Now I will highlight, this is not mining activity. This is cleanup activity. So we have now permission through oversight of the EPA to go to Stimnite and conduct three water diversions and move some tailings that are um, adjacent to the East Fork, South Fork of the Salmon River. The benefit of these is that it will help improve water quality more immediately. Now, the second component of the ASAOC agreement is that potentially, should the Stimnite Gold Project move forward and both parties agree, we would then be able to, to have an agreement and a plan where Perpetua could, alongside mining, address some of the other historic legacies that still remain in the district and need a solution because the solution hasn't been identified within the project itself. So it would really allow for a much more comprehensive and final cleanup of, that's so needed at Stip Night today. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mackenzie. Um, Dale, I'm going to shoot this one over to you. Um, very clearly, I think uh, we have shown that alternative two is a preferred alternative um, under the draft EIS. Um, but there's five alternatives that are in there. Is that standard for the Forest Service to have that many alternatives? And what's the likelihood that one outside of our preferred alternative would be chosen? Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that, that's for them to, to make that decision. You know, these, these alternatives are packaged up as, as alternatives one through five, but there's, there's nothing to say that the forest uh, doesn't, you know, pick and choose aspects of each of these that, and, and package it up as a new alternative. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the water quality management plan is a great example that's going to be part of whatever is selected and, and it would have to be tailored to that, to the other features of the project. But, you know, the, these, these features like, you know, moving the tailing storage facility, that's, you know, that's a big thing. But you could conceivably take that out of alternative three. And although it's got some things that have to go along with it, you know, you could, you could, you know, combine it with some of the benefits of the refined mod pro same thing for the Alpine route, but, you know, we, we, we feel that, you know, because this project is, you know, you change one thing, a lot of other things change. We've considered that in our refinement of the Mod Pro. So you know, as we've put it forward, you know, the, the Mod Pro 2 document, the, ref, the refined Mod Pro, we think it's a great package. But, you know, whether the, 
what whatever the forest comes up with as a final uh, alternative could you know could be a um, combination of of you know several components of any of these alternatives. Yeah, appreciate it. One last question before. Um, we let everybody go. Somebody agreed with you, Dale, that they like our new name, and we're wondering where uh, where we came up with that name and and why we chose it. Well, I, McKinsey, do you want to take <laughs> as, that one? I'm I'm happy to take this one. Um, so, as an Idahoan, uh, a lifelong Idahoan, and multi generation Idahoan. Um, you know, I think all of us know from our Idaho history classes in the fourth grade, the history behind Idaho State Seal. Um, so on it, we have the imagery of Lady Justice and we have the imagery of a minor. And in between them is a shield that contains our river, our mountains, our forests, and our agricultural land. And then at their feet are the bounty of these resources, right? Where we have you know, the ore from the miner, we have the cornucopia from our ranchers and our farmers. And above it all reads Esto Perpetua, meaning may it be perpetual, may she live forever, right? And really the inspiration that we took from this shield that's so rooted in, in Idaho is that all of us have a responsibility to help ensure that these natural resources within Idaho that we all love and cherish can sustain, um, both sustain our families and our people, but also sustain in and of themselves. And there's this beautiful balance that it speaks to and responsibility for these resources. And so when we were looking at changing our name, recognizing that Midas Gold, one, didn't really reflect the philosophy that we take as a company. And it didn't reflect the, the importance of, of more than just gold at our project site, but we've also got antimony and silver as well. And that stewardship that we take over the resources. Perpetua Resources really became clear that it helped us focus ourselves back here in Idaho in these shared values and virtues and helped describe better who we are and what we do. So um, it was a fun process kind of being able to, to be in that position to identify, you know, who are we and how do we want the rest of the world to know us? So we were, were very happy to have the opportunity to, to get to, to claim such a beautiful name with such a rich history. Yeah. Um, that is the end of our questions for today. So I'm just going to go ahead and wrap it up and say thank you so much for everybody or to everybody for attending the webinar. As most of you are aware, we are going to be holding these at least once a month. So please check out our website, perpetuaresources.com, to find upcoming webinars. We'd love to have you come back and join us. And if you think of any other questions outside of um, or after this presentation, please feel free to shoot us an email at community at perpetua.us. Thanks again, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.